I've been so I've been listening to um, so so welcome everybody. And tonight we're going to uh, we were just talking about how um, I was just saying to everybody that I felt like I should be doing someone like Pablo Neruda or someone we haven't really done much of who's who's quite fabulous, but. But no, my heart just wanted to hear more Rumi, so that's what we're doing. And uh, we've been doing a lot of Rumi lately, but um, it's hard to, hard to beat him. And um, I, I find myself never um, never walking away disappointed or disillusioned or feeling like I've heard something inauthentic. So um, <clears throat> probably more to come from here. Um, but I've been listening to Rumi on on Audible recently, and I want to just say a word about that because. Um, We've talked about this before, but just to say it again, that we who are reading the English language synthesize the written word on the left-hand side of our brain, which is the more intellectual side. But when we hear something, we are more likely in the English language to hear it on the right-hand side of the brain. And so um, what I've noticed is that when I'm listening to something that my mind is having trouble grasping, Eckhart Tolle is a perfect example. My mind cannot comprehend a lot of what he says, but my heart knows that it's true. And so what I find is that if I just listen to it, um, I can take it in on a, on a much deeper level. And I have found this to be uh, true for Rumi as well. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I think it's just because, you know, these are writers who are really speaking uh, to the heart and not to the mind so much. And that can be very difficult to, to filter out and to synthesize um, in our heads. So um, all of which is to say, if you have a chance to listen to poetry versus read it, please, please find a way to do that because it's really transformative um, in terms of just um, experiencing the, uh, the deeper meaning and the, um, the transformative nature of um, a poetry in general and Rumi in particular. Um, so I was, I was uh, just teaching in Chattanooga last weekend and Chattanooga is the boyhood home of Coleman Barks. His father was the um, headmaster at Baylor College, which is still there. Coleman Barks' brother is now the headmaster at Baylor Co College. And um, when Rumi was in his early 20s. He was sitting um, by the Tennessee River, which runs right through Chattanooga. It's such a, a beautiful city. And uh, he had a mystical experience that didn't, he didn't really understand. And, and it was that this man, this being, this man who looked like he was from another country came to him and basked him in love and told him that he loved him. And it was a very profound experience for a 20 something year old Coleman Barks. And when he was um, older, he was going to a Sufi meditation, a Sufi zikr in Philadelphia. And the leader of that Sufi zikr group was there and they recognized each other and Coleman Barks realized that this leader who, I forget what country he's from, but if you see a photograph of him, that you can find in Coleman Barks books, he just looks literally transparent, this man, he has this amazing countenance. And it was, it was that man, it was the same man who had come to him in his twenties to tell him that he loved him. So that person became uh, his, his teacher and, um, really, you know, helped guide him through the, um, the delicacy of these poems and the, the flavor of these poems. Uh, and there's another fun story about young Coleman Barks that involves Rumi, and it just reminds me how we all have a, uh, a path that's before us, you know, whether we choose to take it or not, but it's there and it's known and foreseen uh, long before we can see it. He was six years old and he memorized all the capitals of all the countries in the 1943 Rand McNally map. And so at um, Baylor College where his father taught in the morning when they would be going to breakfast, teachers would, they knew this about this young boy and they would call out the name of a country and, and Coleman would yell out the name of the capital. And so a, a teacher just got very tired of this game for some reason and he, and he yelled out the word 
after the name of the country Cappadocia, which at that time um, encompassed what we now know as Turkey. And the capital of Cappadocia was Konya. And young Coleman Barks was completely stumped by this country. And it was the first and only time he's ever not been able to come up with the capital. And so his nickname is Cap by those who know him well for Cappadocia. And of course, Konya, which was the capital of Konya and now is in Turkey, is where Rimi and Shams are buried and where their meeting and, and happened. So um, I love those stories because it reminds me um, so much of the, the, our own stories that we've experienced where there was a, a prescient uh, event that let us know something bigger and better was coming or something bigger than ourselves was coming. If we can um, remember, if we can take the time to see it. Um, so, um, I, I think I, I maybe had known this story, but I, I can't remember. I think maybe I didn't know this story when. So I think we all, we all know the story that, you know, that Rumi prayed um, that uh, he would have a soul friend because he was, <clears throat> as so often people who are at the top feel a bit lonely. Um, and it turns, it turns out that uh, Shams of Tabriz was offering a, a similar prayer to God. And an answer came to him. And the answer was, um, what will you give in exchange if we give you this request that you have asked for, if we help you find this friend that you're searching for? And Shams' answer was, I will give my head. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and then they told him exactly what was. I said you are looking for. Um, Malaladin Rumi, Jalaladin Rumi, and um, in the in the area of Konya, and so um, that price that Shams agreed to pay was in fact the price that he did pay, because we now you know know that um, Rumi's disciples and his son killed Shams, um, or so mortally wounded him that he was never able to come back because he was just simply never found again, never heard of again. Um, so, um, another prescient event foreshadowing our path in life. Um, I am reminded when I think of Shams and Rumi meeting, Rumi was 37 years old. We don't know how old Shams was. I'm reminded of other um, meetings and and the importance of those meetings, we know that Rumi did not write poetry or really his poetry was all spontaneously just said out loud and someone recorded it. So it was actually not written by him until later in his life. But <clears throat> as we know, Sean, Rumi did not write poetry until Sean's death. He wrote it out of his grief. And I'm reminded of when I was at the, um, this sounds very pretentious and I apologize, but I was at the Sorbonne in Paris and I was looking at an exhibit of um, altars, altar pieces. And they were images of Mary Magdalene with Christ. And um, I was just re really looking at those because you know, here in America, we don't really see Mary Magdalene on altars, maybe in a Catholic church on occasion, but you, you would never see it in a Protestant church and not that often here in America in a Catholic church either. But um, if you've been to Catholic churches in Europe, these kinds of saints and iconic people really are, they show up a lot more inside the church in statues or on, on an altar. And as I was looking at these images of Mary Magdalene, I was extremely um, struck with a feeling. And that feeling was that somehow Mary Magdalene, and I realize I'm conjecturing here, so indulge me for one second. I was struck with a very strong feeling that Mary Magdalene was critical in Jesus's mission because she reflected the purity and the intensity of his love back to him that so few people could do. And when I had this overwhelming feeling that that, that was you know, her mission in life and that was, why she, that was why she was there and of course rejected by the disciples because she was had been a fallen woman before she came to Christ and uh, they didn't want her there. Um, 
I, it was, I was so struck by the similarity of Mira and Mira mm -hmm. Baba. And, and Bob is saying that she was the very breath that he, that he breathed and um, how important it is for us to have images and mirrors around us of love when we, um, when we can't find them, when we feel desolation at not being able to find them. And um, so I, for me, I don't know about for you all, but for me, for me, this kind of poetry is that kind of mirror. It really reminds me of that depth of love and that depth of um, connection that, tr that transforms us. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that because I've been thinking about it mm. um, as I've been listening to, to Rumi's work. Mm. There's a lovely quote that I, I wrote down to share with you and it's from um, <clears throat> this particular book, which I don't normally read from because I love the, the Big Red book so much, but it's Say I Am, I Am You. Um, it's one of Coleman Barks earlier translations and um, it's, uh, he did it as a co-translation with a, a person named John Moyna, M-O-Y-N-E. Mm. And um, it has this beautiful uh, drawing of, um, of Rumi on the back. Yeah. We don't very often get to see, yeah. but um, so, so lovely. Yeah. And I, like, I love <laughs> thinking about what, um, Rumi may have looked, at, looked like in his older years. <clears throat> so here's a, qu a quote that uh, Coleman Brooks wrote. Poetry broke from Rumi's grief and turned that knowledge that their friendship turned into a knowledge that their friendship could become his very being, could become Rumi's very being. The paradox of this poetry is that it takes place in the most private region an area of expertise that cannot be shared. And yet that is what it attempts, even as it preserves the secrecy of the conversation that Rumi and um, Shams had. There's a, a saying in Sufism that um, conversation is one of the highest forms um, that you can enter into. It's higher, I believe it's even higher than meditation. And I love that because I know in America, we don't, we certainly don't think of that. We think of conversation as typically being um, <clears throat> a nicety, a politeness, a, you know, um, a cultural norm that we have to fulfill and often filled with something that's not very interesting. Um, so apparently conversation was very highly thought of in the Sufi order in Turkey and so they they were very primed for this exchange mm -hmm. and um when I was listening to to Rumi earlier today um on audible um they said something that just really caught my attention and they said Col Rumi was and this was Coleman Bark speaking about Rumi he said Rumi was not interested in language. He was interested in the silence that creates language. They and I said that again. Oh yeah, he said that Rumi was not interested in in language. He was interested in the silence that creates language. Mm. Wow. And I just think this is a really important thing for us um, to think about because I've always felt like for me as a poet. Um, I've always felt that poetry for me springs from silence and it's the deeper the silence, the deeper the springing. And it's why I, I love to go to the center and write. Um, I actually um, did not know when Kathy Riley dra dra <laughs> dragged me to the center, <laughs> kicking and screaming, I might add. Um, she didn't tell me, you know, that, that, that Mir Baba had not spoken for 30 some years the end of his life and so all I knew is that when I got there I did not want to speak to anybody I, I I didn't want to hear anybody speak and I couldn't figure out what was happening to me and finally I said to Kathy who, who you know those of you know her she is you know the social realm incarnate um I just said to her I, I'm so sorry I just feel so badly I I'm so I apologize I don't know what's wrong with me I just I just can't talk to anybody and I I don't want to hear what anyone has to say I just want to be in silence and then she told me you know, that 
why that I was feeling that so intensely. Um, so um, I'm so grateful to Mir Baba for having sown the seeds of that deep silence at a place like the center and the other places where he has been. And um, love thinking about um, how to find words that can lead us to silence in our own lives so that we can, um, our hearts can be the drum that reverberate with what is of value around us, whether it's spoken or in, in an action or, or in something that we see, you know, the many ways that um, silence can come to us and um, create um, an even bigger silence within us. And so, um, so anyway, any, any thoughts about that? What comes to mind is the Baba's quote, and it, it's when I first heard about Baba, it's something that really stuck out. Things that are real are given and received in silence. Yes, so beautiful. And quite frankly, I still don't understand that, but, but there's something beautifully paradoxical about it that yes. just plays yeah. around inside. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, uh, talking to a friend um, that he and I, um, we were very happy to be in each other's presence and not speaking. And I noticed that. And um, he shared with me that he asked his sister, how did you know when you decided to get married? How did you know that he was the one? And she said to him, I noticed that he and I were just as happy sitting in silence as we were speaking. And I thought, oh, yeah, that is a good litmus test. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I love, 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 love. I love that quote so much. So I'm going to read uh, from a few pieces um, from IMU. And did y'all bring some, anybody bring some Rumi that you would like to, to read, by the way? We'll make sure we have time for it. Telly, did you bring oh. some? Well, yeah, just spur of the moment, I picked up one of my roomy books. So oh, could... good. <laughs> good, good. All right, so we'll break um, before long and, and, and so we can hear that lovely, thunderous voice of yours reading. We all enjoy so much. But this one is called uh, The Womb. There is no prison so dark and small as your mother's womb was. And yet a window opened there from which you saw into the presence. Mm. You felt inf infinite delight. You wanted to stay. This is the secret spiritual pleasure. The way goes in. These buildings are just false fronts. One man curls up in rapture in an outside nook of a mosque. Another walks disappointedly in his elegant garden. You can just read it again. Mm. There's no prison so dark and small as your mother's womb was. And yet a window opened there from which you saw into the presence. You felt infinite delight. You wanted to stay. This is the secret of spiritual pleasure. The way goes in. These buildings are just false fronts. One man curls up in rapture in an outside nook of a mosque. Another walks disappointedly in his elegant gardens. This one is called A Song of Being Empty. A certain Sufi tore his robe in grief and the tearing brought such relief. He gave the robe the name Faraji, which means ripped open or one who brings the joy of being opened. It comes from the stem Faraj, which also refers to the genitals, male and female. 
His teacher understood the purity of the action while others just saw the ragged appearance. If you want peace and purity, tear away your coverings. This is the pur purpose of emotion, to let a streaming beauty flow through you. Call it spirit, elixir, or the original agreement between yourself and God. Opening into that gives peace, a song of being empty, pure silence. A certain Sufi tore his robe in grief and the tearing brought such relief. He gave the robe the name Faraji, which means ripped open or one who brings the joy of being opened. It comes from the stem Faraj, which also refers to the genitals, male and female. His teacher understood the purity of the action while others just saw the ragged appearance. If you want peace and purity, tear away your coverings. This is the purpose of emotion, to let a streaming beauty flow through you. Call it spirit, elixir, or the original agreement between yourself and God. Opening into that gives peace, a song of being empty, pure silence. Tracy, do we know yes. what, what God Rumi believed in? Well, you know, he was a Sufi, and that means he was a Muslim. So technically, that would be Muhammad. But the, the unique quality of Suf Sufism that really um, makes it so um, different from mainstream, um, the, the mainstream Muslim faith is that Sufism was very... Uh, very much a believer in that all religions had something of value. And this is a very uh, little known fact, but I was watching a program on Sufism one day. It was uh, an interview, it was a journalistic piece of interviewing a pretty well-known Sufi from Iran who, who escaped uh, Iran with his life and his children and his wallet when the Ayatollah community took over, who was a, who is a, you know, was a fundamentalist. Um, Muslim cleric and um, Sufis were regularly murdered because they um, believed that art was a pathway to God, a viable pathway to God. And because they believed um, in educating women and because they believed that all paths essentially were of value. And this was so um, embodied in Rumi's life um, as the leader of a monastery that every major religion, a, a representative of every major religion came to his funeral because he embodied that so intensely. And in fact, Rumi married uh, a non-Muslim woman. That'd be like, you know, that'd be like a Jewish rabbi marrying a, you know, Baptist. And he came under a lot of criticism, as you can imagine, for it, and and didn't did not you know did not um, apologize for that at all. So Sufism, in particular, because it is considered the mystical wing of the Muslim faith, is really something that is about embracing, um, as Telly was talking about, embracing the word paradox. Um, which would be either and versus either or, right? And, um, you know, really celebrating that. And, and if, you, if you have a chance to really spend a lot of time with Rumi or Hafez, um, both of whom were Sufi poets, you see the word Christ come up in um, that poetry quite a bit. And when I, was, when I was listening to that documentary about Sufism in Iran, um, the, the last line of the 45 minute piece on Sufism was this famous Sufi scholar whose name I cannot remember saying that there is a 
there's a belief in Sufism. I believe it's a, I believe it's in general in the Muslim faith, if I'm not mistaken, somebody correct me if I'm wrong about this, but there is a belief that when Christ returns again, the Muslim faith will be no longer. There will be no need for the Muslim faith. And he didn't say when Muhammad comes again, he said when Jesus comes again, those were his exact words. So, um, I know we're here to talk about poetry, but isn't Baba said that he was Jesus? So he's yeah, come yes. again? Yes. Muslim faith is, religion yes. is still yes. alive and- Baba has said that, yeah. 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 So I guess uh, I guess in order for the Muslim faith to to be um, disbanded, hey Terry, hey, hey, glad y'all are here. And um, I guess for the Muslim faith to be disbanded, then Muslims themselves would have to believe that someone was the reincarnation of Jesus. It would have to it would be different than someone saying that. They would have to actually embrace that. And, and I know from going to the center that there are a lot of Iranian people who are allowed to go there that, that are given p permission to go to the center because. You know, technically, Mir Baba is um, the leader of the um, American wing of Sufism, Sufism reoriented. So there's a direct connection there. But he was petitioned to take that role. He did not want to take it at all and turn, turn that role down several times. And only, I think, um, apparently only did it because he was petitioned so um, adamantly um, to, to take that role. I believe it was Ivy Deuce who asked him. Someone's correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, good questions. And so, of course, I mean, if you really look at the work of Shams, you know, that was his whole, um, that was the whole point of Shams is, is, was to disband all of the didactic um, conversation around this is right, this is wrong, you do this, you do that, you don't do this, you don't do that. I mean, he literally asked Rumi to throw those things out, which is probably what cost him his life, because Rumi's disciples and his son felt that Shams was um, putting Rumi in a position where he was um, becoming disrespected because he was not doing what was expected of a um, monastery leader in the, Suf in the Sufi order. For example, um, Muslims are not allowed to, to drink alcohol and Shams asked Rumi to go to the wine shop and bring him a bottle of wine and to walk through the town with it and Rumi did it. So that's a big deal, right? <laughs> So, great question. Anybody want to make a comment about that? I mean, the perfect ones are always trying to break down the husk of religion, it seems. Yes. That's. Yes. So, so I guess y'all know this, you know, when there was a discussion about, you know, Mayor Baba saying he did not want he did not come to start a new religion. Um, there was a discussion with Erich and someone else, I forget who the someone else was, about how someone asked Erich, how are we going to stop the teachings of Mir Baba to become a religion? And Erich said, um, by gathering in small groups and sharing your mystical experience. Um, and apparently that was not a word that Erich used, like at all, ever. Um, but he specifically used that word. And so I thought that was so lovely that he chose that word because it really, you know, it sort of, it, to me, it moved towards your, your, a per, your personal experience with the divine and um, the ways that it manifests in your life, which most people would think of as mystical. Um, yeah. I was walking with a friend recently, she's Catholic, and she told me that she really regretted, both of, her, both of her children were born out of wedlock, and she told me that she really regretted having sex before marriage, 
I almost fell out. I mean, I almost, almost like just, just, you know, stumbled over. We were on a path in the woods. And um, I, I said, what? You regret that? She's you know, like 65 years old. She goes, yes, I do. And I, I, I it was like 6.30 in the morning. I hadn't had coffee yet. I said, I just can't respond to this, you know. And um, so finally we had talked enough and I had drunk enough coffee to, to, to respond to that, you know. And um, it was just such an interesting conversation. She conceded that she was sorry she said it, that she thought that it was like what she thought she was supposed to say, you know, versus what her heart really felt. So, um, yeah. You know. Tally, would you like to, to read what you brought? Unless someone else has some, uh, another comment or a question or observation. This is from Essential Rumi. It's called Story Water. A story is like water that you heat for your bath. It takes messages between the fire and your skin. It lets them meet and it cleans you. Very few can sit down in the middle of the fire itself, like a salamander or Abraham. We need intermediaries. A feeling of fullness comes, but usually it takes some bread to bring it. Beauty surrounds us, but usually we need to be walking in a garden to know it. The body itself is a screen to shield and partially reveal the light that's blazing inside your presence. Water, stories, the body, all these things we do are mediums that hide and show what's hidden. Study them and enjoy this being washed with a secret we sometimes know and then not. Hmm. Can you read it again? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> story water. A story is like water that you heat for your bath. It takes messages between the fire and your skin. It lets them meet and it cleans you. Very few can sit down in the middle of the fire itself, like a salamander or Abraham. We need intermediaries. A feeling of fullness comes, but usually it takes some bread to bring it. Beauty surrounds us, but usually we need to be walking in a garden to know it. The body itself is a screen to shield and partially reveal the light that's blazing inside your presence. Water, stories, the body, all the things we do are mediums that hide and show what's hidden. Study them and enjoy this being washed with a secret we sometimes know and then not. Thank you. I'll read bird wings one more. <laughs> Your grief for what you've lost lifts a mirror up to where you're bravely working, expecting the worst. You look and instead, here's the joyful face you've been wanting to see. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding. The two 
as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. Mm. Your grief for what you've lost lifts a mirror up to where you're bravely working, expecting the worst. You look and instead, here's the joyful face you've been wanting to see. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist were always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding. The two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. Thank you. I love that. thought for one moment that you would pick this, the poem that I was about to read next because it's about polishing the mirror and I had to actually look and see and I realized it was a different poem but <laughs> very similar feeling to it yeah beautiful paradox yeah um <clears throat> it's time to wrap. this one is called polishing the mirror when Abu Bakr met Muhammad, he said, this is a face, uh, this is not a face that lies. Abu Bakr was one whose bowl has fallen from the roof. There's no hiding the fragrance that comes from an ecstatic. A polished mirror cannot help reflecting. Mohammed once was talking to a crowd of chieftains, princes with great influence, when a poor blind man interrupted him. Mohammed frowned and said to the man, let me attend to these visitors. This is a rare chance, whereas you are already my friend. We'll have ample time. Then someone nearby said, that blind man may be worth a hundred kings. Remember the proverb, Human beings are minds, M-I-N-E-S. Human beings are minds. World power means nothing. Only the unsayable, jeweled inner life matters. Mohammed replied, do not think that I am concerned with being acknowledged by these authorities. If a beetle moves towards rose water, it proves that the solution is diluted. Beetles love dung, not rose essence. If a coin is eager to be tested by the touchstone, that coin itself becomes a touchstone. A thief loves the night. I am day. I reveal essences. A calf thinks God is a cow. A donkey's theology changes when someone new pets it and gives it what it wants. I am not a cow or thistles for camels to browse on. People who insult me are only polishing the mirror. That ending is fabulous. I know, it's great. I have a little one. It's so true, oh you do? Cool. Oh, that one. Why plague your heart with indecision? Your heart is your pulpit and throne. Don't step down. Intelligence is your crown. Only gems drawn from the depths of you can adorn this crown. Gather them. Hmm. Thank you. Can you remind us the name of the um, translator? It's the woman, Halal, Liza Gafori. Yeah. The woman you turned me, you, yeah. you, have, you turned me on to this book. Yeah. It's a lovely, it's a lovely book. I'm glad you pulled it up. Thank you for doing Did that. Did you read it again? 
Sure. Why plague your heart with indecision? Your heart is your pulpit and throne. Don't step down. Intelligence is your crown. Only gems drawn from the depths of you can adorn this crown. Gather them. Mm. Love it. Mm. Thank you. You know, as someone who uh, used to uh, be in, looked at indecision as a religious choice, um, I was constantly stepping <laughs> on the... <laughs> Well, Terry can tell you, I was always having one foot in one, mm. foot and one foot in the other. Mm. So this was no accident that this mm. one. Mm. What, what helped you to um, walk over that threshold? <laughs> Certainly be in one place at a time. Let the know? recording yeah. be notice that in you case can send energy wherever you want, but you can okay. physically be in one place. And yeah, it can work. And Good point. the fate that you went to the wrong place is not very fun. So enjoy yeah. fully where you're at. And you know what? Uh, the poet Stephen Sondheim. <laughs> has a song um, called Move On in Sunday in the Park with George. And Bernadette Peters' character says, the choice might have been mistaken, but choosing was not. Mm. And I heard that once, and I've never forgotten it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I think it's, I think it's really great to, re you know, remember, I mean, you know, Julia Cameron, when she talks about, <clears throat> you know, allowing yourself to be creative, it's one of the first things she says is you have to be willing to fail. If you're not willing to fail, you'll, you'll never get there. And it's just, it's, it's so, such an important thing to remember, you know, that failure is part of how you succeed um, learn. and how you learn. Yeah. I remember years ago when I was really sick and almost went bankrupt and, you know, just, didn't know how to get, move forward. I kept saying to myself, the difference between people who fail and succeed are the people who succeed simply get back up and try again. And I just like, that was my mantra for a while to just remind myself, you know, that there were no, there were no bad decisions. There were just ones that got me there, you know, that kept me going and um, to just keep going. Again, I know this is poetry, but we saw a movie this week that we can't stop talking about called everything everywhere all at once i heard that was fantastic i haven't, I haven't seen it. even in the movie trailer it says it says to this woman every failure and every frustration has led to you to where you are today yeah yeah it's brilliant it's really it's a science fiction movie which is not oh, a at all at all and it's an two people we really respect and Baba Lovers said that they suggested it to us very strongly. And mm. while it is an assault on the senses, it is so Baba. Mm. So mm. Baba. Mm. Thanks for the tip. Yeah. Uh, it was just here in Asheville and I missed it. So I'm hoping it comes back. Prime video. Yeah, if you have you Prime, it. it's 5 dollars <laughs> Oh, so you can just sit in your living room with a blankie and it's <laughs> warm probably now, right? Yeah, it's hot here. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Without a blankie. <laughs> so, you know, I sat down on the couch with Diane and I didn't even make myself comfortable. I was like, like this. And I watched the whole thing like that with no support in my back or anything. Mm. So it just happened. Like mm. I couldn't. Mm. The thing. If you do watch it, maybe we can come together, any one of you, and talk mm. about it. Yes, it's, poetry says. Yeah. Well, whenever. Yeah. Mm. Thank it's you. really interesting. Mm. Thank you. Always good to hear about a good movie. I have to tell you, the best movie I've seen recently is called Good 
good luck leo grand yes oh we saw that that's unbelievable that was that was winning an emmy and that's that the man. antithesis of that in a way oh, you yeah. know because but it's yeah. the feelings and stuff are there but the yeah. it's the delivery system is very different yeah yeah in yeah that movie, I, I just i don't want to give anything away if y'all are going to see it but the one that that trace is talking about but it is so it's just delicious, is all it's, I can say. It's really it's what's, the name again? What's, what's the name again? Good, good job, Leah Grand. It's about a woman in her, I would say, um, middle to late fifties, whose husband has passed away, and she um, loved him, but never. He's gone now for like two years, but never really had a romantic, sexual kind of relationship. And she wants to feel what that's like. And so she hires this young man and it's about their story. And it's really, really, really amazing. And it's not what you would think it would be like some friends invited me or some girlfriends invited me over. And I was like, mm, I don't know about this, you know, but it's, it's just, it's profound. It's really, really something. It's yeah. one of her best work. Yeah. 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 She, yeah. Emma, Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson. Oh. She's just oh. incredible. incredible. And the young yeah. man is so beautiful to look at. Yes. And so gentle oh, in, his, yeah. in his mentoring her. Yeah. Yeah. That it was, yeah. It yeah. was really, really a lovely incredible. Film. Yeah. Incredible. That was our favorite, too. We really enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of our hour. <laughs> Great way to end. Well, your faces. I haven't seen a lot. I've been, I don't know. Just had, oh, I have a bad back, so I haven't even been sitting in on Artie or anything. It's oh, gonna go. yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, mm. yeah, it's going to go. Mm. But uh, Have we heard the last poem? Well, no, I have like... 10 more, but I could do one more. I mean, um, I don't think we have time for 10 more, but I could do one more. Um, it's actually the, the poem from, did I? It's actually the title poem from um, Say I Am You. Okay, how about that? Okay. I am dust particles in sunlight. I am the round sun. To the bits of dust, I say, stay. To the sun, keep moving. I am morning mist and the breathing of evening. I am wind in the top of a groove, the sun on the cliff. Mast, rudder, helmsman, and keel. I am also the coral reef they found her on. I am a tree with a trained parrot in its branches. Silence, thought, and voice. The musical air, coming through a flute, a spark off a stone, a flickering in metal. Both candle and the moth crazy around it. Rose and nightingale lost in the fragrance. I am all orders of being, the circling galaxy, the evolutionary intelligence, the lift and the falling away what is and what isn't. You who know Jaladine, you the one in all, say who I am, say I am you. Can you